So today, we are talking about the voice of community. And as we plan this sermon series out, this is actually a sermon that we added in uh, because I felt like going through the passages we'd been going through, it was appropriate, but I also felt like there was really a need to talk about community as we come out of a pandemic and what that means for us. Uh, I didn't even realize when I did that that we would be talking about community on a day that it's all about community, about sacrifice for the greater good, about giving beyond what we ever thought we could give for the good of others. And so today, uh, as we talk about community and what that means, um, I invite us, I'll point to our military uh, throughout the sermon, but it's to remember that while our military members serve the greater cause of freedom in our country, as Christians, we serve the greater cause of the kingdom. We serve a God who paid everything for us because he loves us. And so this word community that means association and communion and fellowship, it means close relationship. It's not just about sharing a meal together, though sharing a meal together is significant. It's about being united in relationship with one another. And it's really hard for us to look at that, whether we're in the room or online. I know we've got folks, I was trying to think through in my mind, in at least seven different states that I know of celebrating this Memorial Day weekend. We've got folks all over. But, but wherever you are, we have to recognize what comes against community if we're going to be able to embrace the community we're called into. If we're going to do it successfully, we have to know what we're up against. Have you ever tried to battle a foe that you didn't know or didn't understand? No? Anybody? Maybe online. Online family, I'm going to need some help because, you know, a lot of folks are on vacation and out of the room, so you guys are there. I'm going to need some help today because it's quiet in the house. But that community, that koinonia is the Greek word. There's a lot of things pushing against the very Christian community that God calls us to, right? Because first of all, the enemy comes against community. Jesus came to bring abundant life. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. What is What do we always hear? It's like a military strategy. No general came up with it. Satan came up with it at the beginning of time. Divide and conquer. Like the goal is unity, Satan's goal is to divide and conquer. Why does he want to separate the one so the wolf can get it when the shepherd and the other sheep aren't around it for community? So we've got the enemy. Then we have the fact that we live in this amazing nation that is flawed, yes, that needs to improve, yes. But still, I've been in a lot of places around the world. We live in a pretty awesome place, right? And in that, we have a lot of independence. We have a lot of individuality, and if we weren't strong enough at being individuals on our own, we have every marketing scheme in the book telling us that we deserve to have it exactly our way, exactly our preference, exactly how we want everything, fostering that sense of individual and independence instead of the collaborative community. And then, of course, we have social media, which isn't social at all. I mean, let's, let's face it, social media worlds are our own little mini universe that we have created for ourselves. Like, no, it's like, no, 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 it's not social. Because you pick who you follow and who you allow to follow you. You pick who you friend. Even when you have friended someone, if they tick you off, you can simply mute them for a day or a week or a month without unfriending them. Then they don't have to know that you're mad at them or you just don't want to hear their voice. Like all these things are happening where we control the narrative of our social media feeds. I, I, I guess I'm, I, I'm sure I'm the only one who does this. Because, I mean, really, even the people we let into our social media, even the people we let into that little world we've created, we control what they see. I mentioned in the last service, like, there's that once-a-year challenge that comes around for women to post a photo of yourself with no makeup on. Y'all, come on. How many of us stand in the light, like, okay, if I can't wear makeup, would they notice powder? Can I, let me get the sunlight just the right way. This is me, unfiltered, no makeup, just me, no problem. No, no, I just skip it. I'm just like, I'm 50 years old. Nobody needs to see me with no makeup on. So, but, but then, or 
You catch that perfect moment, right? And you want to capture it, whether it's the meal or the family photo. How many family photos do we see? And we see them on our phone and we're like, oh, no, 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 that's not good enough. Oh, no, no, wait, I want to share this awesome moment in my devotions. It's beautiful. But let me spend five minutes turning the coffee mug just right so the sunbeam hits it while the butterfly flies by. And I'm going to take 30 versions of that photo, find the best one, crop it, highlight it, do all the things I can do. Let me see, do I want to increase the saturation or draw down the exposure? What do I want to do to the lighting? I am not the only one. So how authentically social is all of that, right? That's not community, you guys. That's stage set. And then, because if that's not enough, we think we're controlling what we want, who we let in, and and we are in the people. (laughs) But the Big Brother algorithms have us wrapped around their little finger, and so we're, even when we think we're venturing out to read articles that might broaden our perspectives or broaden our horizons, even when we think we might see advertisements that might show us something a little different from what we're used to, you can forget that because the algorithms have you dialed in and they are feeding you nothing but exactly what you already want, exactly what you already believe. They are doing nothing but endorsing everything about your own individuality that they think they can take you for to go by, or to believe, and nowhere are you getting a difference of opinion. Nowhere are you getting your horizons broadened. Nowhere are we getting a world influence that is equal in any way. So our social media is simply our own little universe, amped. And if that's not enough, if all of that is not enough, We have spent the last 15 months distanced. We have spent the last 15 months behind masks. We have spent the last 15 months in our homes. Necessary, important. This pandemic was no joke, is no joke. Most of the world is still battling the pandemic and is not enjoying the progress that we have made here in the United States. And so not only is everything else against community, but we have literally had to pull back out of community for the sake of us and our neighbor and our very lives for the last 15 months. And so now as things open back up, where does that leave the church in the call to Christian community? Where does that leave us, guys? Because... We were fractured and distanced and individualized before the pandemic as a nation and as a church, Big C Church, not us church. We weren't even born yet. We're in the clear. We are totally in the clear. <laughs> we are an infant church started in the, we are, we are We are one of the original pandemic babies. How about that? <laughs> Bridge Church. Thanks, God. That's pretty cool. But there's this huge question rolling through church leadership all around the country and all around the world about what does church look like post-COVID? Because the church has shifted and some necessary pruning has been done in the church. We have learned that church is not about perfect lighting and perfect stages and perfect rooms. It's about people and we have to connect with people and thank God for technology that allowed us to connect with people that allowed the church to stay connected when none of us could even, like you remember going to the grocery store, gloves, white, like all of it allowed us to stay connected. But now, now that we can come back, what does that look like? Because now everybody's comfortable online. Now everybody's comfortable just doing things when they feel like it. Because we all tuned in out of necessity to our favorite podcasts and our favorite pastors online. And if we're going to not be in church, then we might as well listen to the best pastor we can find instead of the redhead that we're stuck with, right? I'm just, just kidding, you guys. But, but you know what I mean, right? Like, I'm looking for the best. Come on. I'm looking for the best. If I'm online, I'm looking for the best pastor I can find. Like, give me the word that I want to get, Right? Yeah, because individualistic America. Well, anyway. So what do we look like 
post-COVID because the world is busy saying, all right, in the last 15 months, I figured out that I can be a Christian without being in a church. And that's true. You can be a Christian. I can be a Christian without being in a church. My salvation is not dependent on sitting in the seat or sitting in the pew. But can I ask you, how good is a basketball player who's not on a team? How good will solo, how good can he get or she get doing drills by themselves day after day? Where will they be challenged to improve? Where, who's going to identify weaknesses that they aren't seeing in their game? Who, who's going to teach them how to overcome an obstacle that they don't have because there's nobody else on the court with them? I read a story a couple years ago about a guy who was out playing golf, and he, he just went out by himself because he, Buddy couldn't come that day. He's like, well, I don't want to cancel. And he hit his first hole-in-one. And he was like, he, there's nobody here to see it. Like, I see it. That's awesome. And I, I took a picture. Nobody going to believe me. Because we don't just need community to help us when it's difficult. We need community to celebrate with us when it's good. Because the celebration is sweeter and richer in community than on our own. God created us for community with him and with others. Even last week when we talked about running the race, would I have ever run? In an appropriate way, look at me. Would I have ever run 13.1 miles by myself without a community encouraging me? Heck no. Trust me, every year I'm like, I should really do that again. Next year, I should really do that again. And it doesn't happen because there's no community around me cheering me on saying, we can do this together, sweating and running and dehydrating and leg cramping and crossing the finish line and celebrating with me. And yet we have all this mess about tradition and what tradition has made Christian community, which can be toxic and poisonous, what the world has made Christian community, which can be toxic and poisonous, and what Scripture calls Christian community to be. So today, my goal is that we walk through this passage and we figure out what that looks like and we look to Scripture to give us the answers because there is something that's happening as we come out of this pandemic and come back into society and we're in a tipping point of decision as as a society, as the church at large, and as individuals about how will we redefine community. My suggestion is that we go back to the author for the definition. So I want to invite you to read. We're going to be in Acts 2, 42 to 47. And I want you to invite you to read this first verse with me. In a moment, Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves. Who's the they? Do you know who we're talking about? If we go back two weeks in this, then we can remember that the 120 were gathered in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, filled them, and Peter, who could never before get two sentences right, suddenly preached the first amazing, incredible sermon to the church, to the New Testament church. And 3,000 people came to faith that day. And so verse 41 says, Those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves. So first, I want you to think about this. They went from 120 disciples who had studied with Jesus, studied under Jesus, prayed with Jesus, and then Jesus sent to go gather as a group to pray and to praise until the Holy Spirit came. They went from 120 to 3,120 in one sermon. Uh, Imagine infant church plant. Imagine here it is Memorial Day with most of our folks out of town, most of and suddenly every one of you is going to walk out the door with 25 people in your small group. That's what happened that day, from 120 to over 3,000. And so how do you even begin to deal with that? How do you, how do you take the rich relationship that you had with Jesus for those three years and bring each of us 
bring 25 people into it. Well, first of all, it says they were devoted. They were devoted. I love this definition. This is the Greek definition for this word. It's giving me validation in my entire life right now. It turns out I'm not just a stubborn redhead. I'm simply devoted. Because... <laughs> Because the definition for devoted is to persist obstinately in something. <laughs> I have persisted obstinately in many things in my life. <laughs> to give continually, to continue steadfastly, and to persevere. Thankfully, the early church wasn't persisting obstinately in the wrong things. They were persistent obstinately in the teachings of the apostles, which were the teachings of Jesus, which were the Old Testament scriptures that already were, and Jesus' words that would become our New Testament today. They were persisting in that. They were dedicated to that. They were devoted and persevering in that. And that meant that if I am persistent, if I am steadfast, if I am persevering, if I am obstinate <laughs> in hanging on to something, it is not my coffee table book, and it is not my Sunday serving. I am hearing and studying. I am learning, and I am living the Word. And when I do that, because it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, and they were devoted to fellowship, which is koinonia, which is community. That's the word. And they could be devoted to fellowship because the word gave them the foundation that they needed to be unified together around their purpose and their cause, which is Jesus. You see, we, we get it all mixed up because when we aren't devoted to the word, then our preferences and our differences don't have anything greater than themselves to rest on and when we become divided. So when we're devoted to the word, then our preferences and our differences become part of a beautiful, fuller picture of the church because everything is through the lens of Scripture. But when our foundation is not the Word, when our foundation is the world, then those preferences and individualism become what defines us instead of what accents us. And when that becomes what defines us, then anybody who thinks differently, we become divided from instead of connected to. And so we cannot allow our foundations to be the world. Our foundations have to be the word because that invites unity and community. It makes us better together for all of our preferences and differences instead of fracturing us and breaking us apart. So as the New Testament church was divided to fellowship, it says, they were devoted, sorry, devoted to, not divided by, devoted to fellowship, the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, it says. So what I want us to understand is that they weren't, they weren't devoted to teaching and fellowship, communion, eating together, and prayer. They were devoted to teaching and fellowship, and the outpouring of that was the breaking of bread. The expression of that was the breaking of bread, which was a meal that ended in communion, the same as Jesus laid out that sacrament for the, for the disciples. They shared a meal together, and the meal ended with this incredible remembrance. And to prayer, which is what had empowered them. They had watched prayer empower Jesus all along, their prayers, he sent them to the upper room. They saw the outpouring of that in the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And so in that community, they were devoted to sharing things together, sharing the meal, sharing prayer together, leaning into that. So my first question for us today is, what are we devoted to? And I don't mean, I don't mean, it, was it late 70s, early 80s? I don't mean Greece, hopelessly devoted, Olivia Newton-John, hopelessly devoted. Yeah, you know what I love, Greece. 
right? Great. Greece, like, uh, I, I can't sing. Gina could belt it out for me. Shawnee could belt it out. Sanjay, I have like singers all over the room. I am not going to do that. But that's fluff, says the deaf guy in the back. Okay. For those of you online who missed that, my husband thanked me for not singing. So, but not what are we fluffy devoted to, what are we, what am I persisting obstinately in? If you go back and look through your social media feeds, <laughs> that community, your online community, what would they say you're persisting obstinately in? What would they say I'm persisting obstinately in? What am I devoted to? Cookie. Well, that's good cooking because we need to serve meals for Jesus and have people gather around the table. So that works. <laughs> so the passage goes on to say that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs. And your NIVs will say performed by the apostles. And actually, that's not the most accurate translation. What that really says is that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs that came through the apostles. And I think that's a really important designation because as we seek to be in community, we can elevate people up on pedestals thinking they're doing it all, or we can get some awesome gift from God and suddenly think we're on a pedestal and we can do it all. And it's a reminder for us that to be in real, authentic, humble community means that we recognize that the gifts and talents that we have are coming through us to the community, to the community in the church and the community in the world that we need to witness to. And so as we look at that, then for us, okay, that all sounds good. We need to be in community. We need to do this. We need to not be the basketball player by ourselves. Nobody wants to hit a hole in one when they're blown. But what are the nuts and bolts of that? Because we're coming out of a pandemic more churches are closing than opening across the country. 30% of people have said they don't need to go back to church. They can just catch church online, in their online community. So what are the nuts and bolts that God teaches us through his words about what it really means to be in community that can be tools and resources for us as we reshape things? So I want to invite you to read verses 44 through most of 47 with me. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They were together. They were unified. The voice of community is marked by unity. There's no way around that. We are unified, one body, one Christ, one Lord and Savior. That is what we unify ourselves around. And they had everything in common. That, that really means that they were belonging to or participating in the community as a whole. Like, so what that means practically, right, is that when Mary has a need, if we're in community together, Mary doesn't have a need. We have a need. What that means is that when somebody's got a crisis over here, it's not their crisis. It's our crisis, and we help, and we deal with it together, and in that, the load becomes lighter. It means when there's a celebration, guess what? It's our celebration, it means that when we encounter different things, we do it together as a whole, and we don't see ourselves as individuals. The military, I have this up here. It was given to me several years ago, but we call it battle buddies. Battle buddies are friends that have your back no matter what. Battle buddies are friends that go through life with you, and they 
They, they don't ignore your issues. They accept you despite your issues. They love you despite your issues. They will walk through fire with you. Battle buddies exist. That is why people don't come home alive because they're willing to give it all for their brother or their sister. That is community. And can I ask you if our military can do this so well with with the flag as their motivator, which is a great motivator, then what should battle buddies look like inside the church? How much better should we do this? How much more should we be a family that doesn't judge, but that comes beside, that walks, that does not ignore your problems? Because you know what, battle buddy? If you have an alcohol problem and I ignore it, you could die from alcohol poisoning. Or if you are going bankrupt, but I ignore your spending issue and just limp you along, you're never going to get free and walk in the freedom that God intended for your finances. You name the problem. It's not about ignoring it, but it's about not kicking you to the curb because you have it. Because guess what? I have my own issues and I have my own problems and I have my own struggles and I'm going to accept you and you're going to accept me. And together, together, In community, we will work through those things and become stronger. One of the things that I love about um, the cardio combat class that I do, by the way, I'm actually not a morning person, so you know I must like something to show up at it at 5 a.m. three days a week, Alvin Keith Hunter. And so so one of the things I love about our class is that it's this sense of community. Like, we do some really hard stuff, and not all of us are that great at all of it, right? And so when one of us is having trouble or weak or tired, somebody else who's already finished their set will come back and do an extra set beside us to encourage us so we're not in it alone. A a couple years ago, well, no, I'm sorry, last year, last year I have asthma, I don't know if you guys know that, and so... um. There was something we were doing, and I was having a really hard time breathing that day, right? And there's a girl. Her name is Val. She's a grown woman. She's not a girl, but she's a girl. And and Val does every Like, Val outpaces the guys. She's the first one to finish everything, and not because she's cheating, because she is like Wonder Woman on steroids. This girl is amazing in the gym, right? Like, she's fantastic. And so... One day, that day, I was really struggling to breathe, and and it's very rare that I think I'm not actually going to be able to even complete this. I'm going to have to pull back so that I can stay, go to the next thing, or I'll stay after class, or I just don't know if I can do it. And Val was beside me, and she saw that I was struggling. And she didn't go on and finish her set and come back and help me. She cut her pace in half, and every time I squatted, she squatted with me. Everything we did, she did by my side, at my pace, to encourage me, to spur me on, to get me across the finish line. That is community. And that is what God calls us to do for one another. The passage goes on to say that they sold their property and possessions to give to everyone in need. Let me be clear, this is not a a biblical advertisement for communism or socialism, nor is there a biblical advertisement for democracy or, or capitalism. Like, Scripture doesn't endorse a form of government. Scripture teaches us how to be kingdom kids, God kingdom minded, okay? So, but let's deal with the reality of this because we see this, we're like, oh, is that what we're supposed to do? And so I want you to remember that for this festival, right, for Pentecost, people from all over the whole empire came. So you have all these new believers and half of them don't even live there. And there are needs that present themselves. They've got all these new believers coming in. In addition, not to get too grammary in the Greek, But this wasn't a blanket. Everybody sold everything and they divvied it up. It was not like first church commune. We're not going to be the bridge commune. That's not how this works. Because it goes on to say that they met in their homes, which meant they still had homes, which meant they didn't sell everything, right? What it means is that as individual needs arose, the community would see the need Somebody would decide to sell something, and they would take care of the need together, lightening the load on the individual by working together. And I have watched that happen in the 10 short months we have been a church here, 
And let me just tell you, if you haven't had that happen, there will be a moment where you have some money set aside for something, a vacation or a down payment or a bauble of some sort, and someone will have a need, and the Holy Spirit will poke you. Well, okay, so probably he starts tapping or whispering, I'm not always that paying that much attention, and it ends up being a poke before it gets my attention. But the Holy Spirit will nudge you and say, see that need? You're how I'm going to meet it. Your Bible can wait. Your vacation can wait. Six more. It, it'll be all right. But we don't want to be trapped in legalism about that. We don't want to judge anybody else. It's just about that community that sees and responds because it's not your need or my need. It's our need. We all good? good? They continued to meet. Some, some of our verses, versions say that they continued meeting daily in the temple courts. That continued to meet is devoted to. They were committed to meeting in the temple. They were committed to go because that's where the big teaching took place. That's where the courtyard was that they could speak to 3,000 or 5,000 or seven or 10,000 people at once, where they could speak and teach. That's where they got the apostles' teaching before they went back into homes. And so they continued to meet. Guys, we have been meeting online, and the community that exists online is not going to sustain us in a crisis. So the question I have is, are we going to get out of our comfort zone to get back in the community that we were called to be in? Are we devoted to the community, or are we devoted to our comfort? And I want us to understand it is not, mm, it is not about bringing people back into the church for the sake of the church. My whole hesitation and angst in this sermon has been, I don't want you all to feel like you're getting scolded. You're coming back. It's Memorial Day. It's Online family, we love you. It's a little slim picking in here. We're all going to go to Clarity and share a coffee afterward. <laughs> like, But it's not about scolding you to come back to make a bigger church. Because we, we launched in a pandemic. We've got 55 people coming in person. We've got more people coming online. Like, it's good. But I want us to understand this. The temple courts weren't a platform for the church to grow. The temple courts... The community in the temple court was a platform for personal growth. It's not about the church getting bigger. It's about us growing up in the word, getting stronger, and walking in the abundance of life. It's about growing together and iron sharpening iron. Even as I began to prepare for this sermon, Shawnee and I had taken a day or two, a couple days away, some, some for some Sabbath and some for some planning and just some just decompression time and sermon writing out ahead. And we were walking and I was just getting to know her a little bit more. We were practicing community. I was getting to know her a little bit more. I'm like, okay, Dr. Shawnee, what was your dissertation in? And she was like, oh, it was in socialized intelligence. And I was like, is that like Big Brother watching me? Socialized intelligence, what are we talking about here? And she's like, no, social intelligence is, I I did my dissertation, my research on the power of learning in community, how together we learn more and better and become stronger than if we tried to learn as individuals on our own. And I was like, oh, imagine that, because I just started writing that sermon. How about that? (laughs) Isn't it funny that the world is studying now what God laid out as the plan from the beginning? We don't, only learn, we don't only learn better in community, but we're strengthened and encouraged in community. We're battle buddies. It says they were meeting in homes and breaking bread, not with grumpy, grumbly hearts. They were meeting in homes and breaking bread with glad and sincere hearts. Not with fake smiles and Martha Stewart. With glad and sincere. With joy and with honesty. If you come to my house, I'm just going to tell you, it's not going to be perfect. Whatever I serve will be served with love, and I will have done my best to sweep up any dog hair before you get there, and I will, you know 
throw stuff in the closet like every other human being that's not Martha Stewart does. But it's it, like, no, I actually don't throw stuff in the closet. I'm like, there it is. With glad and sincere, honest hearts, because that's community. We can't pretend community. We have to be authentic in community. And when we do that, Scripture says they enjoyed the favor of all the people. They gave praise, enjoyed the favor. It doesn't say they enjoyed the favor of all the believers. It says they enjoyed the favor of all the people around them. All the people. Guys, when we do things the way Jesus called us to do things, when we function like Jesus taught us to function, then we are the attractive good guy instead of the judge and the jury that the world is sick and tired of seeing and hearing from. And so for us, when we operate in community the way we're supposed to, lifting one another up and meeting needs, then that is attractive to the world around us that is starving for authentic relationships, starving for community. This plays out when people in this community of Indian Head openly tell me, I don't like organized religion, but I really like what you guys are doing. I want to partner with you. I'd like to be a part of that. I'd like to help you out. Not interested in Jesus yet, but I really like what you guys are doing. What can I do to come alongside you? Because I see there's some authenticness there. There's some authenticity. Guys, that is what a real community that is reflecting Jesus does. It attracts the people around us. And in that, we get to witness. And in that, people go from, I don't like organized religion, to that Jesus sounds a little interesting. To we witness and they begin to see the power at work, the power demonstrated through the apostles, the power that God demonstrates not because of us, but through us. They begin to see the miraculous. They begin to see the love. They begin to see the healing and suddenly they're in. And they're not in for us and they're not in to make a bigger church. They're in for Jesus. They're in for life. And that is our purpose. Be disciples who make disciples. It sounds a lot like a bridge. You're absolutely right. Because when we do that, the scripture says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This community of faith that was gathering together was not so focused on their own growth that they didn't pay attention to their witness, to their invitation into their community. And for us, we got to figure out what we're going to do with, uh, with that. For us, the church in North America, we have to figure out how we're going to go from 15 months of distancing that divides us, from racial tensions that have divided us, from politics that have divided us, when we've had no foundation to come back together with this is our foundation so that our differences are accents and not division, with this is our foundation How do we come from division back to community? How do we in this room, amplified today, probably should have preached this last week, but (laughs) how do we in a room that seats 90, where we could only seat 35, begin to gather back in and draw back in community with a sense of safety and security? Like why did we require masks for an extra three or four weeks? Because the community matters, and it's about all of us, not one of us, right? And and so what does that look like? What is Bridge Church? What is our leadership team? What is our staff going to do as we try to facilitate, as we set the table for God to facilitate community, for God to bring in community? As an infant church, From the very beginning, because we launched in a pandemic, we launched with two services. By the way, just stop and give a hand to our volunteers, which is most of the people in this room, but give the other volunteer a hand. Because from the beginning, we did two services to to meet the needs of 35 people in the beginning, to now meet the needs of 55 or 60 people on an average weekend in person, because we had to be distanced, but we don't anymore. And so for us, as we seek to 
be devoted to the apostles' teaching and we seek to be devoted to community, then we're going to make a little change. Starting next week, we will have one 10 o'clock service online and in person. Because with our chairs, we have 95 seats, which means we have some room to grow in one service. But in that, and the big struggle in that was we can't not take care of our volunteers. We can't not make sure. They weren't just devoted to the community and the energy that brought. They were devoted to the teaching. We can't have volunteers. I can't have my children's ministry director never get the word on a Sunday morning because she's always next door with the kids at 10 o'clock. So how does that work? No matter how hard the tech guys try to keep up to pay attention to the sermon or, or, or to lean into the word or into worship, they're busy focused on the slides. The sound person's trying to deal with, with um, feedback and different issues and different things. Our greeters are out there greeting with the door open till 20 after. So how do we make sure we take care of you? Because you can't pour out from empty. You have to be filled up so you can pour out. So with our change to one 10 o'clock service in person and online together, we're also going to have, and we tried, we do not have a name for this yet. We just don't. I tried. We'll get a name for it. The Holy Spirit will bring it and we'll have it. But at 8.45, normally our volunteers show up at 8.30 for a nine o'clock service. At 8.45, our volunteers come in the door. We're not going to have greeters. There's not going to be slides. The worship team will be leading the last song of the set as they are in rehearsal. We will join that in worship. We will pray. And I will, to the best of my ability, bring the word to you, the apostles' teaching. I'll deliver the message. No mic. Unmiked. We'll have lights because it would be really dark in here without them. But I mean, like, just family room. Think family room. We're going to sit around with our volunteers, and we're going to go through the word. And then at, at 940, we will open the doors to welcome the 10 o'clock service in. So you will be filled up before we ask you to pour out. Because community isn't about draining someone or pushing them past their capacity. It's about growing them up. The 120 gathered in the upper room together. The leaders met in the homes before they went into the temple courts. They had to be ministered to before they could minister out. But what's your part? If I'm out there, what's my part? Can I ask you to be in line with the scripture and be devoted? To persist obstinately in seeking community? For our local families, I'm not asking you to not go on vacation or to end your vacation a day early. You know what? We're going to have a lot more days like today. Like the world has been pinned up for 15 months. There's going to be many versions of Memorial Day this summer as families can finally go out and travel and do things and go to amusement parks and do all those things. But when you're in town, can I ask that you would be present? understandably, because it's a holiday, but this is the first week in five that we haven't had visitors on Sunday morning. The community is starting to come. The chaplain is telling people in, on the base about the church. Like, so we need to be here to be witnesses, but we also need to be in community to be strengthened. To be intentional about our community of faith as we rebuild our calendars, Forget Bridge Church. Can you be intentional about your faith as the world opens back up and your calendar starts to get filled back up? I think one of the best things of the pandemic was we all had to slow down. We all had space. Suddenly everybody was doing devotions because there was space. We weren't commuting. We weren't overcommitted socially. We didn't have our kids in 16 activities. So as you and I re-enter the world... Keep our faith at the core of our calendar as we honor God by being devoted to his word and to his community. To be part of a team. If you're not serving yet, can I encourage you to serve? Guess what? The serving team did the heavy lift with two services for the last 10 months. 
get plugged in. Because the conversation around the coffee cup and around the table that, that are really your core happen in those smaller teams, happen as we serve, witness to others who need to know Jesus in those moments. As a church, we can set the table for community. We can live as authentically and honestly as we can. And as individuals, we can love well and be committed to not being a spectator or a critic, but being a battle buddy who's in it. A battle buddy who has each other's backs no matter what. Because Jesus said, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. And life happens in the breathing and the living as much as it happens in the ultimate sacrifice of death. As we do that, the Lord adds to our numbers daily. Not for the sake of a bigger church, but for the lives of people who need Jesus. Would you join me, battle buddy? Pray with me, if you will. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you, as always, for reminders that you are the center. You are the reason why we do what we do. God, we are indeed committed to you. We are indeed devoted to you. But God, we ask your forgiveness if we've, you know, gotten a little comfortable. We hear you saying today that You need us to be in community, to comfort others with the comfort that we receive, to encourage our brother, to love on our neighbor. And so, God, so help us if we have a little angst about stepping out of that comfort zone and doing what you've called us to do. But, God, we purpose to recommit to being a battle buddy Mm -hmm. for our community, for people who need us. We have gifts, we have hugs, we have love to give, we have encouragement to give. Help us to get ready and willing to do that as you call us to. Thank you, God, for the reminder today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.